Okay, I think we're, uh, we're ready to get started here. Uh, it's four o'clock by my watch. Um, so this afternoon, this is the, uh, the fleet maintenance panel. And um, you know, like many of the panels that uh, here this week, uh, an absolute all-star lineup. And I'll, I'll introduce our, our panelists here in a second. I wanna start off really by, uh, by saying thanks to the, uh, to the Navy League for, uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, you know, not just this panel, but the entire event. I mean, it really, uh, haven't had the opportunity to kind of spend a little bit of time on the floor and, uh, you know, meet some of the folks that are here. Just uh, really a, an incredible event. And to all the sponsors that are here. So, so thanks, thanks for that. So we're going to spend a f about a, the next hour or so talking about fleet maintenance. Um, you know, clearly one of our, our challenge areas, and this is both in the, in the public and the private sector side. And um, I'll start off by just giving you uh, a little bit of numbers here, um, if, if I could. So, you know, 40%, uh, the on-time delivery per, uh, percentage, okay? And ironically, that's both in the public and the private sector side. Um, <clears throat> 20 to 30% unplanned work, uh, sometimes even a little bit higher of that, um, again, uh, across uh, submarines, aircraft carriers, and, um, and surface ships. And, uh, and then you look at the, uh, the material procurement piece, right? So, uh, you know, trying to drive to, to 100% of all of the material on site, whether in a public yard or a private yard, uh, prior to the start of the availability. Uh, I think we're doing a little bit better on the private sector side, uh, generally achieving north of 90 or 95% of that material on time. Uh, I can't say we're doing the same thing on the, uh, on the, uh, on, in the public sector side. And then in the, um, you know, when it comes to planning, the one thing we look at very closely is uh, the number of planning events, the quality, the completeness of the planning uh, products as we go through the planning event. Uh, you know, for, for public sector avails, uh, you know, for submarines, we're, we're averaging somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of getting that, uh, those planning products delivered on time with an acceptable manner. Carriers, uh, a little bit better, north of, of 90 percent, and the surface ships are doing, doing pretty well there. But, you know, that just gives you kind of an idea of where some of the challenges are. We'll talk about uh, availability execution. We'll talk about planning. We'll talk about material pr procurement. Uh, we'll also talk about, uh, we've got Admiral Vanderley here who, who is the, uh, the head of our, our uh, Facilities Engineering Systems Command and the work that he's doing in recapitalizing our public shipyards through the, uh, the PSYOP um, project. So uh, a lot of good topics to, to, to talk about today. And uh, so let me start off with our first panelist. Uh, and that is Rear Admiral Dean Vanderlei, who is the commander of the Naval Facilities Engineering and Systems Command. So Dean's got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, started off his career as a nuclear trained submarine officer, uh, served on the USS Michigan before going back to get his, uh, his master's degree in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University as a, um, a civil engineer with, uh, with the Navy Facilities Command. He has served um, at all levels across that particular organization um, as a Fleet Civil Engineer, Fleet Forces Command, Navy Facilities Engineering Command in Mid-Atlantic, uh, as well as the Mobile Construction Battalion Force. So, um, and Dean will talk to us about today about some of the work that, that he's doing. Dean, thanks for being here this afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And so, yeah, the, the reason why you have a civil engineer up here with all of these uh, illustrious uh, ship maintenance folks is to talk about the uh, Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan or program or PSYOP as we call it. And so what PSYOP is, is it's really a once in a lifetime investment that the Navy is making in our four public shipyards. Uh, the, our four public shipyards are some of the oldest infrastructure we have in the Navy. Uh, much of the infrastructure dates to World War II and even before. Um, for the most part, built at a time when the mission of those shipyards, it's very different than the mission that they're executing today. So the configuration and the layout of that uh, infrastructure is not ideal. And in many cases, the condition is also um, not great. So this investment program is broken out into three, what we call lines of effort. Uh, the first line of effort is specifically addressing the dry docks, the uh, capacity and capability of those dry docks. And that's been a lot of the initial effort if you've been tracking the program and a lot of the initial investment has been associated with those dry docks. Uh, the second line of effort has to do with the uh, addressing a recapitalization and modernization of the facilities and infrastructure itself. 
And then the third line of effort um, is a recapitalization of the industrial equipment. Some of the things that we're doing in SIOP that make it exciting to me and a lot different than a traditional infrastructure recap program, um, number one is it's based on uh, a, a foundation of industrial modeling. So I talked a little bit about how the configuration of our current shipyards is not ideal. So um, doing a lot of industrial modeling work and coming up with what we call area development plans or master plans so that when we build back this infrastructure in the shipyards, we're not just building it back in the same configuration that's not ideal in the first place, but really looking at how we can uh, build back the infrastructure in a way that maximizes the effectiveness and the efficiency um, of the maintenance that's going on there and really create a return on investment. So not only is it new facilities that has a, a, a payback in itself, but also they'll be configured in a way that will really um, result in uh, savings and in efficiency and effectiveness uh, for the shipyard. Uh, another area that's different is we're managing this. I, I mentioned how this is a massive once in a lifetime uh, investment. We're managing it as a, as a major defense acquisition program. So not identical, but really taking a lot of those um, lessons and the discipline that comes from, from the MDAP process, as we call it, um, to the point that for the first time ever, NAFAC has a PEO. Some of our PEO guys are right there in the front row. Um, so NAFAC has a PEO that's running this uh, investment program. And then the third thing is, traditionally NAFAC has not really been very involved in the industrial plant equipment, and we still do rely on our experts at NAFC for a lot of that, but integrating that industrial plant equipment into the planning and construction of the infrastructure. Um, so those are some things that really make SIOP different and I think are really gonna result in um, an improved, uh, improved public shipyards. Yeah, thanks Dean. Just a, a lot of incredible work going on to recapitalize our shipyards. And like you said, just a really a once in a generation effort there. Our next panelist is, is Rear Admiral Ken Ebbs, who's the commander of the Naval Supply Systems Command Weapon Systems Support. And um, I, I will tell you, you know, Ken is an absolute expert in supply chain management and really what it takes to get parts, to get material uh, supplies to the right place at the right time. A 1990 graduate of, of Vanderbilt University, uh, he holds a master's degree in business administration from the University of North Carolina. And he's a distinguished graduate of the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. And so, Ken, thanks for, thanks for being here this afternoon. Thank you, sir, for that TM. So uh, with that very warm uh, and generous introduction, my first meeting with Admiral Galinas, and he kind of pulls me aside, and he's like, hey, Ken, you're holding me up. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, sir? He says, hey, listen, you know, we're, we're about to go on this journey to get the availabilities back on track, but I'll tell you, as the commander here and, and just as he has walked the shipyards and talked to the mechanics and talked to the leadership, invariably the one thing that popped up in their discussions was material was holding them up. So I'm a supply chain guy. Uh, NAFSUP has not been uh, involved in the shipyard uh, space since the early 2000s. We were bracked out of there, so we didn't have a lot of practice in it. Most of my <coughs> career has been uh, in support of naval aviation and, and the surface forces. But I said, hey, how hard can this be? You just got to go out and get the part. Uh, it's for submarines. They're high priority. How hard could this be? Uh, and th then, of course, we peel back the onion and discover uh, how difficult it is. And, and so one of the things that we've learned on this journey, one, this is a wicked hard problem to solve. Uh, and the reason is, you know, when you talk about material, uh, we, we've discovered there's two types of material. There's the small M material, which is kind of where I dwell in, in the, in the supply chain management, the ability to go out and contract and get parts. Um, but there's a, there's a larger narrative that you have to be familiar with, and that's big M material. And what that stands for, uh, for those of you who aren't in the acquisition world, is that every weapon system has to be properly big M'd. When we go out and build a new aircraft, submarine, ship, there is a very complex ecosystem that supports not only getting the key uh, performance parameters on that ship that the Navy needs, but also the, the probably the more important part uh, but the part that's often neglected, and that is the sustainment tail. Uh, and as, as you heard uh, Hondo Gertz even mention it this morning during the breakfast, right? He's the former guy who was our DNA. 
Uh, he said that, you know, we tend to hyper-focus on what I like to call get the flying saucer out the door, get it under budget with all the capabilities, and then we'll let the fleet worry about uh, how they're going to sustain it. Uh, and that has worked for us for some time until now. Uh, and we are living with uh, the, the results of decisions made, you know, decades ago that are eating our lunch. So what I would tell you is if I've, as my team has done discovery, availability is coming out of the public shipyards, and that's where I've spent most of my team's time this last two years. Uh, availability times um, and performance for Nimitz class carriers uh, is a very, very different problem set that we are doing in the Virginia class. Uh, and that is, the, that is the current barrier um, that we are trying to remove now so that uh, Admiral Galinas can get his boats out on time. So the where we're focused on is twofold. One, we've got to make sure that, uh, you know, historically we haven't captured all of the material demand in the shipyards. And so we have just resurrected, established a, a proper supply department, Code 500 in, the, in each shipyard, which is gonna be the central focus point for all things small M material uh, going into the shipyards for every availability. But I do want to leave you on this note with the more important piece. So the, the more important actor is not uh, up here with us, and I don't think I see him out there in the audience, but uh, this really comes down to the work that uh, Rear Admiral John Rucker has done as the Program Executive Office Officer for, um, for uh, Submarines, P-E-O-S-S-N, because he recognized early on, and I think it's the best thing that Navy did uh, to get this program back up and running was last October, or two Octobers ago, uh, prior to, to this change, uh, we used to have someone in charge of all new construction for Virginia class submarines, and then we handed it over to a guy or gal who would run the in-service part uh, of, the, of the weapon system. And when they merged those two functions into one PEO, Dave Goggins was the first one now doing AUKUS and John Rucker, both of them, I watched their faces over a month have the epiphany <laughs> on, oh my God, what did I do to myself, right? So um, a very painful awakening, but a realization that uh, it's very important that as you're getting your <clears throat> weapon out, you gotta make sure you have sustainment. And so the work he's done to sort of go back in time and try to, try to correct some of the sins of the past is, is the focus area that we're trying to get in here. I'll, I'll close with, so the key for that is gonna be material, uh, the acquisition process, how we've updated it. Uh, and what's also gonna be important is for us to have a conversation about planning. We have got to relook at how we do planning uh, to ensure that the planning and the material ordering are married up in a way that we can be successful for Admiral Galenus. You can have good intentions in either one or the other, uh, but if the two aren't married together in a way that's timely and that's within lead time, uh, we're always going to come up short. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And, and I will tell you, hands down, um, you know, Ken is working some of the hardest logistics problems that we have in the Navy right now. And so, uh, you know, it's really good to have Ken and his teammates is, uh, you know, really kind of working with us on some of these these challenges. Our um, our next panelist is uh, is Rear Admiral Scott Brown. And uh, Scott is our Deputy Commander for Industrial Operations at the Naval Sea Systems Command. And I, I will tell you, there is nobody, and I mean nobody, in our Navy today who understands nuclear ship maintenance better than Scott Brown, okay? He has served at several levels inside of our shipyards as well as at sea. Um, he's a 91 graduate of the Resilineer Polytech Institute with an MBA from the University of Albany. And he's also got a master's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Scott's a, um, a nuclear surface warfare officer, uh, having spent time on the Theodore Roosevelt CVN-71, as well as Eisenhower CVN-69. Scott was also our 107th commanding officer at Norfolk Naval Shipyard uh, after serving time uh, in both Portsmouth and Norfolk previously. Uh, and he came to us from the N-43 job out at uh, uh, out of the uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet, so he really kind of understands the operational perspective and what those folks are looking out out in the Western Pacific. And I'll tell you, Scott makes a difference every day in his job. And so, Scott, thanks for uh, thanks for being here today. Yes, sir. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you to share uh, what we're working on for the Naval Shipyards. So, first of all, there's four Naval Shipyards, public shipyards. 
um, the 37,000, approximately 37,000 um, federal service employees that are under my charge. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of categorize my comments into three <clears throat> areas that I'm focused on and the system that we have created to support those three areas. And the first one is the safety of our people. So 37,000 people, everyone deserves to go home every day with all their fingers and toes. So that's a, a high priority of mine. And uh, you'll see that weaved into a lot of the uh, efforts that we're doing here as we get to improve our planning process and uh, improve our safety posture of the shipyard. So safety is number one. Uh, throughput is, is vital. Uh, we, we are not meeting uh, the throughput that's required for um, all of our availability is much less the notional required for the Virginia class uh, platform. So we've got a fixed capacity of people. And so the only way you increase uh, throughput with a fixed capacity is to either increase the percentage of you know, wrench turners and improve that efficiency uh, within your system there to support um, increasing the throughput that's required on our availability. So throughput's our priority of mine. And I'll go through the, the system again that we've created to work on that. And then the third one is productive capacity, which gets into, into um, the people. So you notice that all three of these priorities, safety, throughput, and productive capacity, the center thing is a people, um, and that's where my focus is right now. The system that we put in place to support improving that, those three priorities of mine, are the uh, Naval Sustainment System uh, shipyard effort. And what we did about um, uh, uh, almost two years, a uh, year and a half ago, we divided that, that um, effort up into pillars. And each of the pillars was um, being led by a flag officer. Now, there's a waterfront pillar, an inside shop pillar, and a people pillar. And those are my pillars as a NAV CO4 to drive. Uh, as a supported commander uh, at this effort, uh, the material pillar is being driven by uh, Ken Epps here, IT pillar being driven by NAV CO3. And with the IT pillar becomes our digital transformation strategy, which I've talked to you know, some of you about today. Uh, we are just, um, I think, learning what a digital transformation strategy looks like. And so there's a lot of uh, learning that's required on our part in the Naval Shipyard business to get better. I tell you, we are, we are um, uh, in living in the 80s and 90s era of, of IT right now, and we, we, we have a long way to go in that area. The next pillar is infrastructure. You heard Dean talk about uh, the industrial plant equipment. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking at some other areas to focus on with our um, deficiency turnaround time and again, our safety uh, posture, their old facilities. Some of these facilities are you know, over 100 years old, maybe pushing 150 years old, and there's a lot of, uh, of issues there. So we're identifying and working on those. Another pillar is the engineering pillar being uh, led by NAV CO5, Jason Lloyd. And really his focus has been on um, in reducing the size of our work packages through technology. So taking some new technology and seeing how we reduce the number of mandates that we have to go work in our public shipyards is where his focus has been. The planning pillar is being led by Admiral John Rucker, which you heard Ken talk about, and also Admiral Jim Downey uh, to work on uh, reducing the amount of unplanned work that we have. So there's a lot of, Admiral Glynn has talked about the amount of unplanned work. We're into 30, 35%, which is a lot. Right, and so uh, how do we get the amount of unplanned work, the, the work that comes up after you start the overhaul uh, down to a minimum number? Uh, there's improved milestone adherence there to planning. Um, there's also to technology that we can use uh, to better assess the conditions of our submarines and our aircraft carriers before they get into those availabilities. They build that work up front. Um, the last one I'll talk about is the fleet pillar. And really uh, the tight commander in the submarine community has really taken on a very active role with uh, you know, driving his perspective and making decisions and improving that, <laughs> his uh, engagement in, in, our, in our efforts at the Naval Shipyards to improve uh, his ability to meet his Title X responsibilities to the fleet commander to deliver his warships to the fleet. And we know that uh, we, are, we are behind and are not currently meeting what the, the uh, component commanders and what um, uh, the tight commander and fleet commander need to support the submarines uh, for our fleet. Um, within, uh, just a real comic, within the people pillar, so on a productive capacity leg, uh, we, are, we are challenged with um, hiring right now. Uh, if you look at the, the pay rates of our federal workers, they're getting paid, for example, down at Norfolk Naval Shipyard about 14% below what the private sector is paying. So we've got a, a number of initiatives in place to improve the pay uh, to, to, for our artisans in the, in the, in the shipyards there. Uh, one is some special pay rates that we're working to get approved. 
We've also got a promotion for expert mechanics. So this has never been done. So you get a, you reach a certain journeyman level in the shipyards and historically you cap out as far as your promotion goes. You're now giving them a promotion ability as a wrench turner to become a master in their trade is one other area I'm working on. So just some of the things to give you a flavor of what we're working on tied to the people of our, of our public shipyards. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Eric. And again, you know, just every day, Eric is making a difference and just breaking down barriers in the work that he's doing, um, working with our shipyard, our four shipyard CEOs, the leadership teams inside the shipyards to, uh, you know, to really kind of get after the challenges in nuclear ship maintenance. Our, um, our next panelist is, is Rear Admiral Eric Verhaeg. So Eric is a commander of uh, our Navy Regional Maintenance Centers, as well as a director of surface ship maintenance modernization and sustainment. And, um, and I will tell you, so Eric owns the other 80% of the Navy, as I say it, onto the surface <laughs> fleet. And, um, you know, again, all that work is done in, in the private sector. Um, you know, Eric's leadership combined with his operational experience uh, make him absolutely top notch. And, and there's no one better for the job and what he's doing out there. And I don't think a day goes by in a week, uh, you know, that, that Eric and I aren't talking about uh, you know, some of the things that he's doing there. Uh, a 91 graduate of the Naval Academy, he's got a, uh, a master's degree from the Naval War College in National Security and Strategic Studies. Uh, he served as flag aide to, uh, to Second Fleet, Striking Fleet Atlantic, uh, and also was a member of the uh, Chief of Naval Operations Strategic Study Group uh, number 26. Uh, Eric commanded the USS Carr and was the XO on San Jacinto. And again, I'll tell you, there's probably nobody with more passion and more energy uh, about surface maintenance than Admiral Verhaeg. And so, Eric, thanks for, thanks for being here. Sure. Um, thank you, sir, for that. The political science degree occasionally is useful um, <laughs> in this business. Um, but I don't have any. I, I got a D in DFEQs at the Naval Academy, so <laughs> I try to stay away from that. Um, just on the onset, welcome done to the Navy League and to the sponsors and to Sea Air and Space. Really a, a great. Uh, event. My daughter had a chance to attend the STEM event on Sunday, so I don't know if anybody else had uh, family do that. She had a, had, a, had a ball. Most importantly, it's a chance to have a dialogue and conversations and, uh, and uh, exchange ideas. And I, there's a number of shipmates uh, and friends and uh, colleagues from both uh, from the Navy and the industry side and the audience. Um, I would say we're making uh, real progress, not enough progress, but real progress uh, as a combined surface maintenance, modernization, and sustainment uh, team. And by team, I mean it's the fleet and the surface TICOM, and then it's NAVSUP, NAVC, and the PEOs uh, in strong su support. Uh, we're largely aligned. Um, we're certainly pulling together, um, and we're on a campaign to, to get better. And you may have heard of Competitive Edge and P2P, and I won't, uh, I won't cover that. For sure, while we're making progress, there's much more to do before we're even close to where, where we need to be. Like Scott, I'll just talk about three items at a high level, and then we can see where the Q&A uh, takes us. Three items that we're focused on. Um, Project Team Health it was, was, is one of them. Just surveyed um, uh, the 1,200 or so key leaders on our project teams, got almost a 50% uh, response rate, which has actually uh, uh, surprised me and uh, already some good feedback from us on barriers, on uh, the things that are holding them back, uh, where maybe we can empower them a little more. Why do we see so much turnover? Um, we need to do some focus groups with them uh, to, to, um, to, to learn more. Um, we're looking at data when it comes to our project teams. We're actually looking at avails and whether they were on time or not and other performance metrics, and then linking back to the individual that was leading the team whether it's the contracting officer or the PM or the port engineer, um, athletes keep score in this way and, um, and we're, uh, uh, we're doing the same. Uh, and in the end, we want to have the right kind of seniority, experience, makeup, skills. Um, I'm not, I think we're doing okay, but there's definitely some improvements needed by an illustrative example our program managers at an RMC that are managing a $20 million avail are at the, at the GS kind of 13 level. Um, and by the way, it's the same if it's a $300 million avail. So clearly 
we need to differentiate the work and set our folks up for success. Um, the second topic would be innovation strategy. Um, that topic is a passion for me. Not only does it unlock kind of the ideas of our workforce, but it can help, uh, you know, get us better outcomes and ultimately make our folks' jobs easier. Um, and we um, aligned our innovation campaign to an outcome, right? It's not about activity, it's about an outcome. And our outcome that we're trying to focus the innovation team on and all the RMCs is, um, is on uh, reducing the duration. Not just reducing the time that we're late, but actually reducing duration. In other words, improving our productivity uh, and our effectiveness. We want to make the most out of every day of maintenance uh, that we're given. And so for some of you with new construction experience, you know, they manage to budget, they'll manage to space, weight, and power, and cooling. We're trying to manage time. And, uh, and, and like your effort, Scott, uh, and Emma Lloyd's effort, kind of reduce the time it takes us to do uh, some of these uh, tasks. Um, we'll fail in some areas. I think that's okay. Um, I'm confident that uh, we're gonna be able to bring timelines uh, down. We already have made a little bit of progress in that regard. And the last example I'll just uh, finish with, it, it'll bring a little bit of um, uh, Admiral Epps' piece in the mix. Um, we're trying to do better with the long lead material, have made substantial progress there. Um, we also have a lot more to do uh, with sparing, and here it's more of the C21 hat, with battle spares, um, with um, rotable pools, um, uh, all the things that um, we need to get right. And, um, and by we, me, it's, or we, it's really um, the PEOs that deliver the systems along with my team that sustains them. Um, forecasting is something we're getting better at. We're taking a page from the, um, the submarine community and their eye forecast. And um, we're doing more what we call directed maintenance, um, taking a page out of the commercial sector, where if you look ahead, we know a pretty good portion, uh, pretty good uh, detail, the type of work we're gonna do. And so we call that directed maintenance. And last year, we were at about 62% of the total work package was directed maintenance. And the cool thing about directed maintenance is it then lends itself to more accurate forecasting and a better demand signal for NAVSOP and our DLA partners. So just, um, just three of, I, I could talk about this topic for um, a couple hours, actually, if I was allowed to. I won't, and look forward to your questions. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, and, and again, you know, the work that Eric's doing, I mean, across the surface uh, fleet, it, it, it's an area that, you know, the, the sun really never sets on the work that Eric does, whether, uh, you know, you're over in Japan, in Sasebo, or or Yakuska, you know, to the West Coast, East Coast, all the way to, to Bahrain. I mean, there's always something happening in his world and just uh, a tremendous, tremendous effort. So, you know, we're going to kind of shift into the uh, the question and answer part of this. Um, so I invite, we've got a couple of microphones, I think, up front here for folks uh, to come up if you've got some questions on some of the things that you heard or, you know, maybe things that you didn't hear that, uh, that we're working on. But, you know, again, when you think about, so, um, you know, Dean talked about the PSYOP work, right, and all the work that's going on in, in Portsmouth, uh, the material piece that, that can, I mean, that is, you know, absolutely foundational to, uh, to the work. And then, you know, both Eric and, uh, and Scott touched on the people part of this, right, and this competition for talent that we're in. So, so just a lot out there. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and kind of go to the team here in terms of questions. Go ahead, sir. Hey there. Uh, Sam LeGrand from USNI News. Um, I think a lot of the conversation around maintenance right now is about building capacity for the backlog. What about emergent battle damage? How are y'all? <coughs> pardon me. How are y'all set for that? How are y'all set for um, you know the idea of there's a conflict being able to turn around and get ships back into the fight in a in a, in a pretty quick manner? Um, how are y'all thinking and talking about that? Thank you. You want to start? You want to? You want to go first? Or? Yeah, I, I'll uh -huh. start from my from my uh, my pack fleet experience, and now at the naval shipyards, I think uh, so. There's a um, um, a strategy that pack fleet is uh, developing and, and is using actually a conops that they have that that, that discusses our um, uh, remote ability to do repair on warships when they're damaged. So there's a there's a conops out there 
I think the, uh, the, the question really is how we would execute that. Your question on capacity, I'll give you an example, um, uh, two examples, right? On the West Coast, we, the Connecticut had an issue. We brought it in the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. The Puget Sound Naval Shipyard was relatively balanced in their workload to um, uh, uh, workforce numbers and were able to absorb the Connecticut without too much um, shock and awe. On the East Coast, Norfolk Naval Shipyard was not quite as balanced. We had to put Helena into Norfolk Naval Shipyard and that threw all the other schedules out. So the balance of the workload to workforce um, uh, capacity is absolutely vital to, for our ability to absorb any types of bumps in the night, or any damage that would happen. So there's that aspect. Uh, from, a, uh, from the PAC fleet perspective, you know, pushing uh, repair efforts out into remote areas is that, is that focus. And I think we're really in the planning stages of that right now, um, uh, doing some exercises. And Eric can talk to some specific things the surface fleet has done uh, to practice our ability to do remote repairs uh, in overseas locations. And then building them other places, not bases, we'll call it, uh, for access to go um, handle types of things in, in the Pacific fleet. Yeah, I'd uh, speak to three things, uh, Sam. W one is um, First Admiral Galinas appointed a director of wartime readiness or, uh, um, by the name of Rear Admiral Bob Dotson. So he is uh, kind of helping to integrate, knit together all the efforts that the PEOs and the directorates have been uh, working on to make sure it, um, it comes to the collective kind of capability we need. Um, we're practicing. Um, uh, a couple good examples. Uh, one is sometimes just at the individual repair item effort. And the most notable example would be um, with one of our ships in Japan and uh, the, the duration was going to be uh, this long and, uh, and our fleet customer was not satisfied with that and said I want to treat this like battle damage repair. And, uh, and we brought resources from CONUS and from Hawaii and had an integrated project team and they reimagined kind of with that diversity of experience and perspective to significantly shorten the timeline on that, on that repair. Uh, another example would be a sonar dome had a gash in it and it was uh, a pretty significant uh, degradation. And uh, in this case, we challenged ourselves and, um, and came up short. Um, and um, so those are, you know, but at the, more, at the larger level, we're actually um, detonating charges on our, uh, ships uh, prior to the SYNCX, if you know, sometimes we do SYNCXs at sea. And, and so t both East Coast and West Coast, we've done that, um, carefully detonated the charge, we did some analysis ahead of time to make sure it wouldn't sink. Um, and then we brought mobile dive and salvage from the fleet aboard. And then we brought the uh, RMC and the engineers uh, aboard. Uh, and in Hawaii, uh, we even got industry aboard to look at it. And so we did actual real damage, assessed it, what would it take to repair? And then the last piece is um, I'm excited about is uh, Admiral Mustin, uh, Chief of Naval Reserve, Admiral Galinas, uh, assigned us at the RMCs, Mayport, Norfolk, San Diego, Japan already had it, reserves so they could be with us in peacetime, <coughs> train, and then uh, operate with us. And then when uh, in crisis, um, they'll play a stronger leadership role. But it was important to have them with us, alongside us in peacetime. And uh, so I'm excited about all three of those uh, efforts. Yeah, and just real quickly, you know, more from a holistic NAVC perspective, uh, Eric mentioned the, the wartime readiness cell. You know, this is a small team. That, that's their day job, right, to think how NAVC would respond as an organization. And we have tremendous, I mean tremendous capability across our organization from, you know, our, our public shipyards to the work that Eric's doing with the private yards, uh, our warfare centers, um, you know, <coughs> down into our new construction yards and across the, the headquarters directorate. And it really is, uh, you know, everything from how we finance avails to how we would contract for this work uh, in a quick manner. Uh, we talk about our diving and salvage teams. Uh, you know, the, there's a cyber element of this, okay? <coughs> Uh, and again, you know, I mentioned the warfare centers and what they do. So um, there's a couple of different things that we're, we're looking at. So that, that's a great, uh, great question. Um, Mike, please. Good afternoon. Thanks a lot. Uh, a few years ago, Rich Brown, when he was uh, Surf for, was advocating for this idea about open and inspect. Don't, don't we know enough from opening and inspecting tanks or whatever it is on a DDG-51? Don't we already know that we can expect problems? 
And can't we already factor that into the, to the work package um, and save some time by doing things that way? I was wondering if you've adopted any of that at C21 and um, has, it, has it borne any fruit? I know, I know Rich was really big about pushing that. And yeah. I have a second question, if you don't mind. Uh, ship repair workforce in the private yards, how are we doing there? Do we, do we have enough welders? Do we have enough people that do that kind of work uh, to really um, get ships out on time? Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Um, on the open and inspect piece, um, we have made that a priority. We are, uh, and our goal is to have the open inspect done by the 20% of the avail or no later than that point. There are occasionally some uh, leakers that, that happen. Um, so our, our metrics are improving there, more to do. Um, our knowledge of tank condition is also significantly improved. Um, the last remaining gap for us, which is not too hard to close, would be the new construction as it comes to us, have we documented the right way? And generally it's pretty good, but it needs to be documented um, uh, to, to uh, how, have a strong foundation. Um, we still have too much growth in new work, for sure. Um, we still have too many front loads, in my view, and some things that create uncertainty for the project team on both the government side and the, our industry uh, aside. Um, so progress, um, more to do. Um, and there's even some technology that we're thinking through. I mentioned the innovation piece earlier that we'd like to leverage to maybe allow us to assess and then there's nothing like old, plain old-fashioned chip checks, and we need to do better there. Um, with regards to service force and the um, industry um, side, um, you know, I, I think uh, Paul Smith may have talked about this on his panel. We've, we've got to, we still have work to do before mm -hmm. we have provided uh, the stable and predictable demand that our industry partners need. Um, so I'll just be uh, uh, frank with, with, with you. And uh, if I said anything different, you'd call me on it, right? So we have more to do um, with regards to stable and predictable demand. Because um, they will respond when we do that. Um, uh, welders, um, Mr. Lin, my partner in leadership, is still working the, uh, the common weld qual. Um, we are talking about and, um, and working some uh, legislative proposals. We have more to do to get them across the finish line that would um, maybe um, allow us to partner with industry to strengthen the workforce, um, you know, kind of. Um, so improving, still fragile in some areas. We've got to do a better job of providing stable and predictable demand. That would be my answer, Mike. Can I jump in real quick on the opportunity, although not surface related, but submarine related, I'd maybe take the opportunity to ask for help. Uh, I mentioned, and Emma mentioned our, our unplanned work rate uh, of pushing 30, 30, 35% in our availabilities. So much that growth is part of our daily business. And we're talking um, uh, main ballast tank, uh, internal tanks, uh, hull structure, um, you know, and all those inspections that, that you can't really, uh, from a visual, uh, can't really tell what's happening there until you start doing some ultrasonic testing maybe or some maybe some deeper visual testing. So there's an opportunity for us uh, from a technology perspective to understand better what the condition of our main ballast tanks, internal tanks and hull structure is. And I think, uh, you know, there's potential opportunities out there from a technological perspective to help us. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Kirk Crater, Executive Director of Trident Refit Facility, Kings Bay. Uh, we've talked about getting real, getting better, and maintaining our competitive edge. And uh, the strategy for that is to maintain our current ships and build new ones. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in all of this about quality of life for workers and focusing on the people. Admiral, I believe you discussed some shipyard initiatives, special pay, system experts. Um, as a Fleet Force Command, it seems like we're working in silos we're going to be competing for the small set of, of skilled workers. And my fear is that when a special pay table comes out that affects nav C commands, and I've heard it's also for the regional maintenance centers, that I'm going to get stripped of my workforce. And uh, so I'm wondering what we're doing to protect workers from other organizations from being stripped to go to 
the construction of new ships vice the maintaining current ships? Uh, yeah, so I'll try to answer that question. Uh, the, I'll tell you, the, I think you may understand the process of special pay rates. It's all based off of retention and um, uh, your ability to get folks in the door and retain them. And so you have to submit, there's a ton of push-ups you got to do to get these things approved. You have to generate the tables with the data. And I say, I'd say um, actively, I can't say there's anything actively I'm doing to protect the other organizations right now, but I will tell you that if you assess you've got a retention problem, you, you have the ability to um, submit uh, a special table, a special pay table as well. And I don't know specifically for TRF Kings Bay if you guys are having the same challenges that we're having in the public shipyards. You know, I think up at, up at Ports and Naval Shipyard, um, the the private folks that you can go to work at uh, some of the fast food restaurants at the same rate that uh, we're paying incoming shipyard workers to go work in the main ballast tanks I talked about, right? So it's not the same from a physical and a <laughs> mental ability but uh, the, pay, the pay is relatively equivalent. So uh, there's a problem there. Uh, and so you know, that's been my focus. And maybe you're right, we, maybe we are too, from a Navy perspective, too overly focused on those. Um, I can tell you though, they're geographically different. So I, I just, I don't, I guess I don't, I don't know if we're gonna have Kings Bay folks, they're gonna, not gonna wanna work Kings Bay and go up to Norfolk Naval Shipyard and work. You know, I just don't know that. But it's a, probably not the satisfactory answer to your question, but. That's from, from my perspective as a, as a Naval Shipyard commander, um, you know, we are losing people and it's because of, a lot of it is because of pay. And so I've got to go fix that. Thank you. Yeah, Kirk, I thought that was a great, uh, great question. Um, there is probably a need for greater dialogue on workforce development, workforce stewardship. Um, um, I've had, uh, I can think of examples where I've had folks hired away from us um, based on other commands and we have done the same. Uh, most recently we hired some folks and right away from the type commander that had, you know, on fire safety, it would be an example. Um, we have, um, we've had a health assessment process at the regional maintenance centers. Um, we're trying to strengthen it and uh, not just technical side, but the business competencies, contracts, uh, comptroller, all the things, safety, all the things that make an organization successful. Um, and then I think when, as that matures, we'll be, and I mentioned the project team health piece, we'll be able to kind of strengthen our technical business pyramids. There are places where we don't have the right depth of bench. You probably don't either. And then one person leaving creates a problem. We, we cannot, we should not be that um, slim. We, we, we need to have better depth of bench. Um, and we're actually working on classification uh, and, and um, uh, to, to try to get it so that we can have one classification approach across the enterprise. Um, last point I'll make is uh, we, we Fleet recently uh, uh, gave the regional maintenance centers um, the three R authorities, recruitment, retention, and relocation, which um, by themselves don't solve all our problems, but they can be a helpful tool. Great question. I, I've, yeah. I have one other point too I want to make is I think this, you could probably jump in on this one uh, that'll help you as well. The, the public law section 737 of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, right, uh, limits pay increases for federal workers. And so if I've got a, a with federal wage grade survey that, that I've got at North Naval Shipping, for example, that says my journeymen are being paid 16% below private sector, that limits the, the, um, the amount they can get to a, a pretty low number, like the order of like two or three or 4%, right? So uh, we're working to try to get that removed. That, that process is flawed on comparing federal workers to the civil sector. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a fair comparison with the extra requirements that we place on our, our federal workers, right? Overtime, op tempo, uh, drug tests, uh, you know, mandated vaccines, whatever it may be, they don't, they don't have those same things in the civilian sector and so comparing pay tables <coughs> becomes sort of ineffective at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Davida Nellums, International Global Solution, also United States Naval Academy, class of 90. <laughs> uh, my question is around the sustainment challenges that you all have mentioned. Um, are you finding that it's more of a life cycle management, obsolescence 
uh, perspective or a concern, uh, spares, forecast, management, or supply chain availability, and what's being done to mitigate those concerns? Yeah, hey, Davida, I'll take that on. And the answer is yes. Oh, yeah, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, you know, how much time we got left here. Um, what, what I'll share with this group, I'm going to winnow down on where I think this group might, uh, it may resonate with you. So one of the challenges for us, you know, Admiral Galena is like, hey, Ken, why can't you get these parts? So I'm looking through going, why can't I get these parts? A uh, couple of things. So in the hierarchy of parts and, and how hard they are to get them, I would categorize from hardest to least, you know, submarines, sub, uh, you know, sub safe level one, super hard to get. Next, naval aviation, critical safety of flight, very, you know, also there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. And then last is surface, right? Because essentially you've got all the redundancies built into there. So our, um, our threshold to leap over is going to be a little bit less. Um, so fast forward, Virginia class. So, you know, I'm looking to, why can't we get these parts now? And this is, this is a confluence of all, if, if things don't start off well in the life cycle and the way the program sets up that platform for success, you're gonna feel the bubble 15, 20 years down the line. We're down there now. Essentially what has happened is um, we, the big Navy made it, we, made, we took risk. We love to say that we took risk on some sustainment saying we'll figure this out or these parts that we built will last forever so you'll never need to replace them. And then we took the boats out and we broke them and now we have to replace them. So challenge number one. And then challenge number two is, you know, the biggies for us uh, in the OEM world is, is obsolescence. So, you know, not that they just stop making them, but, you know, business is incentivized to go toward production and to keep up with pace and demand. And, and so as the brutally efficient machines that they are, they're going to look down line and go, where are we going? Where is this palm taking us? You know, what's the next block? What's the next lot that's coming out? And what people oftentimes forget is that that original block oftentimes will run out of stuff. And we just kind of, we can kind of keep going to the cupboard, pulling the parts down and it's great until we can't anymore. We go back to the manufacturer and they don't make it or the, the, the sub doesn't exist anymore. So that probably is the one thing that has really hurting our lunch the most is how do we, di diminishing manufacturing sources and obsolescence are the thing that, if I, if Admiral Galinas asked me, I would tell him that's our greatest challenge. The rest of the stuff, we can bend the cycle to correct the mistakes that we've made. So we are bending that now. John Rucker is bending that now with us to kind of fill in the divot. That's a math problem we can solve. We cannot solve a math problem when an OEM stops making something and they, their production line ends and this, this, this boat is gonna be operating for 30 more years. How do we do that? So I think, Davida, that is uh, symbolic of the entire supply chain challenge that we uh, live with now. Yeah, I had the opportunity with industry to spend some time on the Hill. Uh, Chairman Garamundi, I think actually might be the ranking member now from California. Um, there was some, some frustration in the crowd, mostly business, about um, DLA not buying parts. Um, and the, chair, and the, the, the congressman goes, I like to ask why a couple times. And so it was a back and forth. And eventually it got to, he pointed to himself and said, we haven't properly funded the, the sparing accounts, right? So there's a money piece to it. There's a strategy piece, there's yeah. a teaming piece, but for sure there's a money, a money piece as well. Yeah. We've made some progress. Yeah, now let me, I wanna add though, Davida, so we've talked, you've heard about Get Real, Get Better, P2P, NSS. So what we don't want to do is just say, hey, we just need more money and all your problems go away. Cause I yeah. will tell you in the sustainment triad, my team's job is the easiest. Supply is of, of the three legs, engineering, maintenance and supply. Really, when it comes down to it, we just have to solve for X. And it's really predicated on how well the engineers design that mousetrap and how well the mechanics, who I think are the center of the sustainment universe, can repair those things and turn them out. And once you calculate how well that mousetrap is engineered, coupled with how fast those mechanics can get it back out, all my team has to do is solve for X and, and order those parts. I've overly simplified that. Uh, but 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 it's it's key to recognize that the buying part is the easy stuff and the hard part is getting the other pieces right or how can we look at the supply chain so NAFSUP as a supply chain integrator for Navy 
We don't own it, but we are embedded in every element of the supply chain from the foundry all the way out to the tip of the spear. And so what we have really stepped into this last two years is identifying, hey, let's quit trying to spare our way out of this. You know, first of all, CNO doesn't want to hear, I need more money for OPN. We, we need more OPN, but we need to change the discussion and go, if it, the, the best way to get a better mousetrap is to design a better one, an even better way to do it, and I love our sailors and Marines and Coast Guardmen and all that, but can we, can, if we have uh, aberrant behavior where those sailors and whoever are breaking them in a way that, is, that deviates from normalcy, our ability to tampen demand will do more to save precious resources and keep the ecosystem running than anything else. And that's that's not how we operate. We just go, hey, I need a part. It's not there. Suppo, what's going on? We've changed that dialogue in this last two years, and I think it's really been a foundational shift uh, for the sustainable self sufficiency plan. piece, right? Yes, in self sufficiency. That's that's wartime, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is this is this team's, to, in my mind, Davida. This has been our get real, get better moment. Changing that from, and this is, and I I do subs two days out of the week. I do surface one day out of the week, and I do naval aviation the other two days out of the week. And this is across all those warfare domains. We are having that discussion, uh, and it's going to have a profound impact on how we sustain our forces. Why do I get just one day? <laughs> well, That's the first time I've kind of picked up at that. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, hey, that was a great quote. The, the last thing most for a lot of this room, I'll kind of foot stomp the importance of the industrial base, right? And a lot of times, in, in whether it's maintenance or new construction, we think industrial base, we think shipyards, but I got to tell you, it goes all the way down the supply chain to those, you know, third, fourth, fifth tier suppliers down there, okay? And, uh, you know, Ken talked about the supply chain. That's really where, you know, we go out of production and parts, it's hard to kind of restart that in many areas. So it was great, yeah. great answer. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, Rick Easton, retired Naval officer, uh, Naval Surface Warfare officer. Um, first of all, I appreciate, uh, Admirals, your unvarnished presentation of the statistics, so that's the get real part. Looking at the get better part, uh, a couple of questions. One is, in the decade, last decade, the decade of 2000, maybe the decade of the 1990s, did we do significantly better? And if so, do we know why in those time frames we did? And then going forward, one thing that um, has con Founded me for a long time was whether our port engineers are really effective. It seems to me that if we're not defining our work packages well enough in advance, that and we're missing a lot of stuff, are we missing stuff that we should have been catching? If you look at the civilian industry, and while I think they've got a much simpler problem in the cruise industry or the merchant marine industry than we do on a warship that's far more complex, nevertheless, they manage to keep those ships steaming you know, 24-7 almost every day of the year, maybe a couple of weeks out for a ship of ale or something, and they come on board in mass and get a lot of things done. It's not clear to me that our port engineers really have their hands around the capability or the state of the ship, so material condition. And then I do think there's a crew aspect. Are we, in fact, training our commanding officers down to our deck plate seamen correctly to identify that? I mean, obviously, we've got to train to go to war, but I was taught SOSMARC when I was in 05. I was not taught SOSMARC when I was in 01. And I should have been taught SOSMARC as an 01, because then when I did my zone inspections and things as a junior officer, I would have been much more effective in contributing. And I don't know where that stands either. But the thought process is, how do we get better? Good question. Yeah, Admiral, um, great question. Mandatory technical assessments are up. Backlog of depot maintenance is coming down. We have more work to do on eye level, though, and ship's force backlog. So we still have more work to do there. Um, avail durations are starting to come down. Um, and it's, at, you know, and we're, and we're focused not just on the timeliness of it, but the duration period. So, um, so I think the trends uh, and the amount of dollars and the return we're getting on it has, it has been a steady increase in the last, um, you know, I'm going to say five, six uh, uh, palm cycles. So we are making progress. Um, on the subject of port engineers, I think we need to invest more in them. When I talked about project team health, they are part of that. Um, they are participating at the senior port engineer level. And we're evaluating performance 
uh, for a ship of ale, as I mentioned, not just on the PM, but also on how the port engineer. And I would say we have probably more port engineers that are contractors than I would like. I think there's an inherently governmental piece and a long-term stewardship piece that I'd like to see. Um, and we need to make assessments, whether it's ship checks or by the planners or uh, industry, once they've been awarded the contract, uh, they need to make it a priority. The last thing I'll just say, uh, by way of example, won't totally answer your question, is uh, um, Swoboss, Admiral Kitchener, Admiral McLean and I just jointly signed out a guidance on our CMABs, our continuous maintenance of ales. We have said that uh, it'll be six weeks as our standard duration, and we've given ourselves performance goals, which we'd not have before, for O-level, ship's force, I level, which is in my lane, and depot, which is you know how we partner with industry, right? So very importantly though, organizational level, intermediate level, and depot level all have performance goals. And, um, and our, our, our goal is um, to, and we're gonna award a little earlier as well. So I'm excited about um, keeping score and having productivity goals for ships force and the regional maintenance centers. Um, that'll be, a, that's, a, that's a good step forward for us. So I'll Good. let you know how it goes. I heard, I heard um, one part of your question was, did we do better in the 90s and 2000s? Um, I'd like to comment on that uh, from Scott Brown's opinion. And uh, my uh, experience in the Navy so far, um, first of all, the, um, the workforce, comparing the workforce now to the workforce in the 80s and 90s, it's vastly different. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a fair comparison to say, you know, the base of the drawdown of the 90s and uh, the size of the, you know, say just the public shipyards back, the number of public shipyards that we had versus that we have now, um, it's not a fair comparison, I think. And then you look at the, the age of the workforce that we have now relative to what we had then, it's really much more junior now. Um, but I will say um, we're not victims of that, right? Um, uh, I, I'll be self-critical of our, over the last, you know, 25 years in that junior workforce that we've been hiring up we have layered on, um, we have layered on oversight, layered on supervision, layered on paper and requirements, and I think you know my take is we got to we got to get back to reducing some of that and be better back in empowering the mechanic, uh, like we used to have. So there's a training element of that, a proficiency element of that, and then there's a there's a we got to um, you know wean ourselves off of a lot of this these paper requirements. So the workforce is vastly different. The, uh, the operational cycles of our, of our submarines, Virginia class versus the 688, the robustness of that, of that hull is way different than it, than it was. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll comment is just the material condition of our SSBNs and GNs and uh, carriers uh, as the 68 class, uh, like ages, for example, we're seeing uh, changes there. So just some changes. So yeah, you could say we're doing better or worse, you know, uh, Arguably, uh, yeah, we are doing worse from a delivery perspective, but the, the picture has changed quite a bit. Good. We're doing better today funding ship maintenance, repair, life cycle support than we did 10 years ago, positively. My only thought process in looking in the back was, was there anything we can learn, obviously in context of the things that you've laid out, Admiral? Yeah, so I think, I think my take is uh, we gotta get that efficiency back and empowerment back. Okay, we're down to like the last couple of minutes here, so maybe two more questions. We'll try to keep the answers crisp, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Matt Zirkel, my company is uh, is uh, Defense Maritime Solutions, formerly Wartzilla Defense. We repair all the submarine force propellers and we supply submarine shaft seals, for instance. It seemed logical for us to get into the sub-safe business. Some of my colleagues up there are aware of that. Um, when we started to do that about a year and a half ago, but we put the pause button on when we found out that actually Navy isn't really sending hardly any subsafe business out to industry. Um, big investment to be able to do that. I'm wondering if, if there might be an update on progress to try to use private industry to do subsafe repair. Yeah, I'll start on that. I think, Ken, you can probably pile in. I'll I tell you from a, um, that's, I'm sure it's frustrating my boss, that question, because <laughs> he's pushing <laughs> on us God. to do this. And, uh, and uh, myself, uh, John Rucker, Ken Epps, and uh, you, know, you know, teeing things up, getting it through the snake to get it approved, 
and, and funded and, um, and uh, uh, technically ready to give to you uh, as a challenge for us. And we have some short-term efforts to go get there. I can tell you strategically though, and we developed a 15 year um, submarine maintenance strategy last year. And uh, uh, a big aspect of that strategy is one, balancing public shipyard workforce capability and capacity to workload. And when you do that balance with a fixed capacity workforce, you have to give some work to private sector. And so we're looking at giving a, uh, about 130,000, 150,000 more man days a year into the private sector uh, for, uh, for um, uh, helping us uh, come through. Um, you know, whether it's uh, rotatable pool components in the inside shop that are kind of right up, I think, your guy's alley, uh, or, or to actually contracting out, which Norfolk Naval Shipyard does pretty well for um, some preservation work in main ballast tanks, for example, or torpedo tubes that they, they contract out. So those areas of specific uh, contracting um, to uh, um, give more work to the private sector. Yeah, no, Admiral Galenis is very clear about wanting to, you know, put more of this work in the commercial sector again. You know, naively me, I'm like, oh, how hard can this be? Uh, and then I discover how hard it is. There's just infinite number of hoops to go through. I think, uh, uh, you know, our track record to date, our, the big hour in this room track record, hasn't been great with respect to the critical path parts that are in rotable pools. So I think the last statistic that I briefed to Admiral Galenis is, you know, right now, um, you know, about 87% of all of our work uh, is done in across Admiral Brown's inside shops. We want to change that dynamic, um, and and I think we're moving out to do that. So I, I ask for your patience. Give us some more time, but yep. uh, our, we, we've been given clear direction to do that. Um, and and notwithstanding any financial hurdles, uh, that should not be an issue. We just got some time to jump through. Okay, we're, yeah. we're standing by if you need anything from us to help. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, and one way to get at this capacity yeah. issue that we're, we're talking about. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, sir. Steve Walsh, I'm with WHRO down in Norfolk, um, where we've had a number of uh, suicides uh, among Navy personnel mm -hmm. over the last several months. Uh, many of them sailors who were in maintenance cycles, their ships were in maintenance cycles. So uh, what is being done to make that, uh, that situation, the maintenance cycle, more livable for that junior sailor? Uh, to s make sure they're not uh, losing their sense of mission and just, you know, they're feeling still part of the team. That's, um, so I had four of those uh, sailors and um, uh, it, it, it's been a, was a tragic uh, circumstances. Um, each one has a different story. Um, um, the common factor was they were assigned to my command. Um, um, one of the things I did, um, and it's kind of uncharted territory for me and my leadership team to have so many. We've had experience with one, maybe two, but to have four in this short order really caused us to uh, do a lot of introspection. And there wasn't a playbook for us to follow. And uh, one of the advice, uh, pieces of advice that I got from um, one of the professional staff on the Hill, on the military subcommittee was, hey, go talk to the, to the Army in Alaska. And that's what I did. And I spent about two hours um, with that Army general. And um, his main point to me was it needs, it's fundamentally about um, whole person support and making sure that everybody has hope. And um, that kind of seems obvious, doesn't it? But that's really been underpinning our leadership approach to responding. Are they financially healthy? Um, how about, uh, do they feel valued? Um, do they, um, um, uh, you know, get in the right uh, medical care if, if appropriate, right? You can go down the list. Physical fitness, mental hit fitness, all those things. So the whole person um, piece and focusing on that is kind of how we have been navigating on it. I've got an amazing CO down on that waterfront, an amazing leadership team, and um, they're on a good trajectory. But for sure, it's a tragic loss and something that um, uh, we've been doing a lot of thinking and, and action, to be honest, over. Okay. Eric, thank you. Hey, uh, for the team, I, I want to thank you for your questions and the dialogue this afternoon. 
Um, for the panel members, um, Dean, you got off late to their shipmate, um, <laughs> but, but Ken, Scott, and Eric, but the, the entire team, you know, just a, a tremendous group of leaders up here um, really getting after some really, really hard problems for the, for the Navy. So thanks for your time this afternoon, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>